Hello and welcome to the fourth lecture of the deep learning course. In the previous lectures, we've seen how to build a basic neural network, how to train it using backpropagation, and we've met our first specialized layer, the convolution. Putting all this together, you can build some pretty powerful networks already, but doing so is not a trivial process. Today, we'll look at some of the things you need to know about how to actually design, build, and test deep neural networks. First, we'll look at the broader outline of what deep learning looks like in practice. What, does a, what kind of steps do we go through in a basic deep learning project? Then we'll dig a little deeper into why any of this, these methods work at all. And then in part three and four, we'll delve a little deeper into the technology and the tricks that we need to understand and add to our toolkit in order to effectively build deep neural networks. So let's start with a broad outline of what deep learning looks like in practice. The general timeline for a deep learning project looks like this. We pick a task, we get some data, we build and debug a model, we develop the model, tune the hyperparameters, and then if we're in academia, we publish our model, or if we are in a commercial setting, we push the model to production. So we'll go through the process in this order. One of the most important things to understand in deep learning is how to manage your data. Now, this is something we expect you to have learned already in a basic machine learning course. And the principles are the same as they are for any machine learning setting. But just because it's such an important thing to get right, we'll go over the basics uh, again very briefly. The first thing is, if we want to figure out how well our model is doing. If we want to gauge the performance of our model, we need to withhold some data. We need to test the model on some data that it hasn't seen during training. To do this, we withhold some part of our data and we call this the test data. Now, because it's important to use the test, set, test data only once, we then withhold another set of data called the validation data this will allow us, for instance, to tune the hyperparameters like the learning rate or the batch size. Once we've chosen all details of our model using the validation data, we can then use the test data and make sure that we don't overuse the test data. And once we split off our test data and our validation data, whatever is left off is our training data. If you're using a, a, a benchmark data set, then they often come with a canonical split so the data is already split up into a test and a training set, and these days often uh, into a test, a validation and a training set. But if your data isn't, then you have to split it in this way. Now, it's often said that deep learning is a data-hungry practice. So let's think a little bit about how much data do we really need in order to effectively train a model. And before we can even start looking at how much training data we need, we should look at how much test data we need. So let's say we're doing a very simple classification task. In that case, what we're doing with the test data is we are estimating the accuracy. So we're taking a number of samples from the data distribution and we're estimating the probability that we get a given sample that we classify that correctly. And that estimate is what we call the accuracy on the test set. Now, depending on how big our test set or our validation set is, that estimate of the accuracy comes with a confidence bound. If we have a data set of 100 instances and we measure an accuracy of about 0.5, then the confidence bound is about this big. If we have a data set of 100 instances and we measure an accuracy of around 95%, then the confidence bound is about this big. And as we get more test data, the confidence interval shrinks around 10,000, we see that the confidence interval becomes so small that it's barely visible in a plot like this. Now, the takeaway here is that if our test set is very small, we can't really confidently tell the difference between a model that has 50% accuracy or 55% accuracy, which means that if we train a model like this, or if we're tuning a model like this, we don't know confidently how to choose between two models with these performances. And that's why it's so important to have a large test set. Because if you don't have a large training set, then your model may not train. But if you don't have a large test set, then you can't even tell whether or not your model is properly training or not. So the process looks roughly like this. 
you look at how much data you have in total, you split off a test set that allows for small confidence intervals, and as we've seen, 10,000 instances is ideal, 1,000 instances is reasonable, and below that, we should uh, start getting worried. We split off a validation set of a similar size, so half the test set is, uh, is fine if you have limited data, and whatever's left over is your training data. Now that's a lot of data, and in a lot of cases you don't have this kind of data, especially when you're looking for labeled data. That's often difficult to, uh, to get. So what should you do if your data set is just too small to do this sort of thing? Well, the first thing is to consider not using machine learning or deep learning. Quite often there are simply other approaches which would also work, and on such small data sets would work much better. If you don't have alternative approaches, one way to go is to collect a lot of unlabeled data. Often the problem is that labeled data is very expensive, but unlabeled data is easy to get. In that case, we can train in a self-supervised or semi-supervised setting, where we train an unsupervised model first on the unlabeled data, and then refine that model or use what that model has learned in some way using the limited labeled data that we have. If you're evaluating on a small test set, often by using clever techniques like 5x2 cross-validation, F-testing, you can get a little bit more confidence out of your small data set. But the principle says that if you want to be confident about which model you should prefer over another model, you simply need a lot of test data. Now I've said it already, but it bears repeating. You shouldn't use your test set more than once. This means that when you're building a model, the first step you should do in any product project is to split off your test set and to put it to the side. Make sure that you don't touch it until you're ready to state what your model is. Once you've tested your different architectures that you're trying out and you've tuned your hyperparameters like your learning rate and your batch size, then you've fully committed to one model. You're ready to say this model is the best and that model you can then use to test that on. But the more often you use the test set, the less valuable it becomes. So the proper way to do it is to split off a validation set and do your tuning on the validation set. Like I said earlier, you should have heard this already in a, in a machine learning course. But if this is new to you, then make sure you, uh, you understand what's going on and why you should do this. Another problem with test sets that often happens is test set leakage. We think we're using a test set properly or a validation set properly, but it turns out that somehow information that the model shouldn't have access to in a realistic setting is leaking into uh, either its training setting or the way it is being tested on the test set. For example, if we're doing spam detection, it might be that before the data set was split, the emails were shuffled around without regard for their time. And this means that an email we've trained on might be in the future to an email we encounter in the test set. This is an unrealistic setting from, from which the model can derive an advantage. If this advantage is strong, then we should leave the emails in order, split them at a particular point in time, train on the past and test on the future, and do the same for that validation train split. Another instance of leak, test set leakage occurs in link prediction. Here we see an example of a knowledge graph. We don't need to know the details of link prediction yet. All we need to know now that the goal is to predict whether or not a particular link uh, is likely to exist between two nodes. And in this case, we withhold the test set by withholding some of the links. And the problem happens if there are reciprocal links, like the child of link and the parent of link. If both of those relations are included and we withhold links randomly, then we might end up withholding the child of link and training on the parent of link, which makes the prediction task very easy because we just add back in the child of link where we've observed the parent of link during training. So in this case, if we want an a more difficult link prediction and a more realistic link prediction task, we should make sure that either these inverse links are removed or that when we split off the test set, either both 
inverse links end up in the test set or in the training set. In general, a lot of test set leakage happens if we do pre-processing before splitting. So for instance, normalization, if we center the data by subtracting the training set average, that's fine. But if we center the data by subtracting the average over the whole data set, then that includes information from the test set. To show that test set leakage happens uh, at all levels, here's a, a, a small section from a recent paper on a GPT-3 model, which is a very big model trained by OpenAI, so big that it costs several million dollars uh, probably to train. And after training, the researchers found out that some of the data they had used to train on was included in some of the test sets that they were using for evaluation. And this is an easy mistake to make in their case because they were training on basically a, a crawl of the whole internet of the, or the whole World Wide Web. So it was very likely um, that the test sets, the, the evaluation task that they were using to evaluate their model included uh, had some overlap with the training data. They did their best to filter that out, but they found out after training that something had gone wrong. So that's just to say test set leakage happens to the best of us. There's really no foolproof way to stop yourself from, uh, from having this kind of problem. And it's one of those things that you have to train yourself to be aware of. So that brings us to debugging our model. Now let's first look at why debugging is actually difficult in this setting of deep learning. Why is debugging more difficult in deep learning than in any other programming setting? And there, are, there are a few reasons. The first is that neural networks almost always fail at runtime. So a lot of programming languages, not Python particularly, but a lot of programming languages are quite good at catching bugs at compile time, mostly through type inference, um, and things like that. The compiler can tell that something's gone wrong, that you've made a mistake, and before you even run your program, you already know that there's something that needs to be fixed. In deep learning, almost all the data structures we use are tensors. So even if we have type inference, it's not going to help us very much because every single object is a tensor. The main mistake that we make is a shape errors, trying to multiply tensors together that have the wrong shape in order to be multiplied together or multiplying tensors together in a way that doesn't do what we think it does. And this is the kind of mistake that we will always see at runtime. We have to run the program before the mistake happens. That's not the worst of it, however, because neural networks quite often fail silently. So there are a lot of features like broadcasting that are very helpful, but that will succeed even if we're not quite doing what we think we're doing. And even worse than that, neural networks may not fail at all, which is to say a neural network is a pipeline of linear algebra that we optimize to minimize a particular value. And if it happens that that pipeline runs, even though it's not quite doing what we thought it was doing, then the whole thing will still train and it will still converge to a particular minimum. So uh, quite a lot of the time we have a running model and a running program that doesn't give us any errors. And we don't know whether it's, we are actually looking at the best performance our model will ever give us or if we've simply made some mistake that we need to fix. And if we fix that mistake, then the performance will improve. So in order to um, still program effectively and efficiently in this kind of setting, we need a few tricks more than we normally need them. And the first of those is the assert. You may have used this already in some, uh, some other programming projects. If not, it's a very simple construct. It exists in most uh, languages and it's simply consists of the assert keyword followed by a condition. And all this is saying, I am at this point in my program asserting that this condition is true. And if that assertion fails, so if the condition after the keyword assert is not true, then program execution will stop and crash with an exception or an error. And this is very useful to make your program fail fast. So basically, if we think in the back of our heads that a tensor that we're working with has a particular size, like B, C, H, and W, then we can assert that so that if we've made a mistake somewhere in our reasoning and that's not true, we get an error right away instead of uh, a model that tries to train despite the fact that there's a mistake somewhere. In Python, you can follow up the condition with a string, as we see in the second line here, 
and that string is then printed if the assert fails. And that can be very helpful for immediately getting some, uh, some information about what's gone wrong. If you combine that with an F string, as we see in the last line, then that's a very neat way to also print out some helpful information about the state of the program at the moment that the assert fails. There's no problem in um, doing stuff that's expensive to compute in an assert because it's very easy to turn them off during the program execution. It's a simple switch in the Python interpreter that means that all the asserts will simply be skipped instead of checked. So even if your asserts impact performance negatively, that's not a big problem because it's very easy to turn them off. It does mean, however, that you should be careful where and when you use asserts because it means that usually if you're writing production code, the asserts will be turned off. So you shouldn't, for instance, use an assert to validate user input because then that validation will not be turned on in production code, even though you will still be getting user input that needs to be validated. So in that case, you would simply use an if statement. One of the um, most common mistakes, one of the most common sources of mistakes in deep learning code is broadcasting. This is a feature of NumPy and PyTorch, which basically allows us to um, apply element-wise operations to tensors of different shapes and sizes. And this is very useful. It, it helps us to, for instance, multiply a scalar by a matrix or a vector by a matrix in an intuitive way, but occasionally it does things that are not intuitive. So here we have two vectors of ones, one of shape 16, a one-dimensional vector and one of shape 16 by one, a two-dimensional matrix. And if we multiply these together, the intuitive thing to happen would be to get another vector of 16 elements, all of which are ones. That's not what happens in this case. If we multiply these two vectors together and we print the shape of the resulting vector, we see that it is a 16 by 16 vector. So what happens here? Under the hood, what NumPy does is that it first aligns these two vectors and it does so on the rightmost dimension. So the 16 in the purple vector gets aligned with the one in the teal vector. And then it expands the singleton dimensions in both vectors to the size of the other vector. So both vectors are expanded or broadcast into a matrix and then element-wise multiplied. So this is a counterintuitive way for uh, broadcasting to work. And th for this reason, it's important to know the rules for broadcasting logic precisely. Luckily, they're not very difficult. So to reiterate, broadcasting is applied to any element-wise operation on two or more tensors, like summing, element-wise multiplication, division, and even certain slicing operations. And the rules are fairly straightforward. So if we have a, a two matrices A and B, one with three dimensions and one with two dimensions, and we apply an element-wise operation, in this case summing, the first thing NumPy does is to align the shape tuples to the right. So the three in the B matrix gets aligned with the one in the A matrix. If they are not the same size, the shorter uh, shape tuple, so the, the tensor with fewer dimensions, has singleton dimensions added until they match. And then the singleton dimensions are expanded until both shape, shape tuples are the same. And by expanding, we simply mean that the existing elements are repeated along that dimension. And once the um, shape tuples match, we can do a element-wise operation. And the danger is usually in this aligning, because this means that dimensions in one matrix will be matched with dimensions in different matrix in a way that is unintuitive. So how do we avoid this kind of error? Short of reminding ourselves what the um, broadcasting logic is. Well, one good trick, if you're unsure, if you're worried that you might be running into uh, a situation where broadcasting errors might happen, is before you apply the element-wise operation to add the singleton dimensions yourself. So to only apply an element-wise operation once you know that the two 
tensors on which you apply the operation have the same number of dimensions. In this case, we add manually a singleton dimension to the tensor B so that we know exactly how the tensors A and B will be aligned before they're expanded. And this usually is enough to make broadcasting a lot more intuitive. Another trick that's often useful is the keep dim keyword or keep dims in NumPy, which is simply a, a keyword that you can use in most of the operations that remove one of the dimensions. So if we have a matrix, for instance, and we sum out the rows, so we sum along the rows, we are left with a vector. And the uh, default behavior is to remove the dimension that we've summed out. However, if we say, um, if we set keep dim to true, then that dimension is kept in the resulting vector as a singleton dimension. So instead of a vector, we get a one by n matrix. And that means that if we then apply an element-wise operation, we are already applying the element-wise operation uh, to two vectors with the same number of dimensions, and we can be sure that they will be aligned correctly. So in this case, we are normalizing a matrix along the rows by first summing out the rows, but keeping the dimension. And then we apply an element-wise division so that uh, the matrices will be broadcast together correctly and we get the normalization behavior that we want. The third line shows a very simple pattern that is extremely useful. Basically, whenever we get a tensor input, it's very good practice to immediately request the size in this way and to give each of the sizes of the dimensions a handy one letter um, variable. One of the main uses for this is that you can then, throughout the method that you're writing, add asserts about the shapes of the tensors. So as you perform different operations, the shapes of the tensors change, and it's often quite difficult to keep track of. So if you add as many asserts as you can, as you can in between these tensor operations that change the shapes, you know that you will always catch errors uh, as close as to where you make them as possible. Another error that's common is a memory leak. So here is a very reasonable bit of code that almost everybody who starts writing PyTorch ends up writing at some point. We have a, a loop over the epochs, and within that loop we have a loop over the batches, which, loop, which loops over the whole data set. And for each epoch over the data set, we would like to keep a running loss, sum over all the losses we've encountered for all the batches in the data set. And we would like to print that once the epoch is finished. So that's very reasonable. So we initialize the running loss to zero, we train and every time we encounter a loss, we add it to the running loss. The problem here is that underwater, we mustn't forget that these are computation graphs and everything we do to them creates nodes in that computation graph. Now in a normal training loop, if we weren't keeping this running loss, at the end of the inner loop, our computation graph would be complete and our garbage collector would know because nothing refers to the computation graph anymore once we go into the next iteration of the loop. The computation graph becomes detached from all the other objects, so the garbage collector knows that it can clean up the computation graph. In this case, however, what we've done by adding this running loss is connect all the computation graphs of all the batches together into one big computation graph, so nothing ever gets cleaned up and we will see that eventually our memory will fill up. The solution, in PyTorch at least, is to call l.item. This is a function you can call on any scalar tensor, which returns the uh, contents of that tensor as a float. If your tensor is not a scalar, you can also call, use functions like detach and data, which also provide you with a tensor that is detached from the computation graph so that the computation graph can be cleaned up if it's not being used anymore. So at this point, let's imagine that we have a running model. We can start training. One of the things that happens very often is that we get none loss, not a number loss. So somewhere during our computation, something in the computation graph becomes either not a number, infinite or negative infinite. And after that point, very quickly, everything else also becomes not a number. And the first place we see this is usually in the loss. Now, this might not actually be a problem 
with our training setup. It may simply be that our learning rate is too high. A high learning rate often leads to things uh, becoming infinite. So the first thing to try is a very, very low learning rate, simply to see if that's a problem, and a zero learning rate. These are not quite the same thing, and both are worth trying. If that doesn't solve the problem, and even with a low learning rate, the, the network runs out of control, the best thing you can do is to localize the problem using these asserts. Then, what you might see is that you're getting a loss. Your loss stays within reasonable bounds, but it doesn't change. It doesn't go down. At this point, you might start wondering whether it's a bug or whether they're simply you're simply reaching the limit of what uh, can be learned from your data. You'll still have to uh, do a few basic checks, check a few learning rates. Usually you scale these logarithmically. It's important to check your gradients, by which I mean see that uh, all parts of your model that you want to train get valuable gradients. Sometimes the gradients are none, sometimes they are zero. Uh, this is not always easy because PyTorch is quite effective in cleaning up gradients that it doesn't need. So you can call backwards, but then when you try to inspect the gradients, they're no longer there because PyTorch knew that it didn't need them uh, anymore and it cleaned them up. So what you can do is call on a tensor for which you want to inspect the gradients, you can call x.retainGrad before you call the backward. And if you do that, then the gradient for that tensor will be retained and you can print some statistics about that gradient to see what the minimum size and maximum size and mean size are. And that will usually give you an idea of whether any part of your model is actually getting a learning signal or uh, whether the gradient is either vanishing or simply never getting there. So let's imagine that you've done your debugging and you have a basic running model. How do you now develop that model <clears throat> to improve its performance? A mistake that a lot of people make is to come up with a very complicated and fancy model and then rush towards an implementation of that model and run that and start experimenting on that model right away. The problem is, if you build a very complicated model right away you, and it doesn't work, you won't know why it doesn't work. You won't know whether you've made some mistake somewhere or the model simply doesn't work and the idea is no good. So to avoid this problem, it's good to start with a setup that you know works and then build on that step by step. So the keyword here is to get baselines set up. Baselines are competitors to your model, other models that give you certain performances. And this could be something complicated like a competing model, something else from the literature, something simpler like a linear model, like a one layer neural network, or something ridiculously simple like a majority class baseline or a random class baseline, which will already help you calibrate uh, what kind of accuracies you can expect. And once you have your baselines in place, Basically what you can do, you can start with a baseline that, uh, that looks a bit like the direction you want to go in and slowly add features bit by bit and slowly increase the size of the data, slowly increase the size of the model and slowly increase the difficulty of the tasks that you evaluate the model on. Here's an example. Let's say your plan is to build a six layer convolutional neural network for classifying MNIST digits. What you can do is start with a linear model. This is easy to train. They're convex models, so you can easily find a global optimum without much trouble, without uh, relying too much on, on the choice of hyperparameters. And this will give you a baseline that you know this is the best that a linear model can do. If you then add a convolution before that linear layer, and you don't use any activation and you don't use any pooling, then you know that this new two-layer model should have the same expressivity, should be able to express the same functions as the one-layer model, which means that you should get the same, be able to get the same performance as you got in step one. If you don't, then something is perhaps wrong with your implementation of the convolution. If you do, you can move on to step three, which is to add an activation. Now this does change the expressivity of the model, but we know that you usually activations don't hurt performance. And this, in fact, 
can help us to try out different activation functions. So we might try out a sigmoid, and if the sigmoid does actually hurt performance, we might switch to a ReLU activation. Then we can go to step four and introduce max pooling. This strictly reduces the size of the linear layer, so it may hurt performance, which we may make up later by adding more convolutions. At this point, we're pretty sure that the rest of our code is sound, so if the performance drops, then we know that the max pooling is the cause of the performance drop. At that point, we can start building up the number of convolutions step by step and so on until we've reached our goal of building a six layer convolutional neural network. So the main lesson here is that if you don't know why it should work, you won't know why it doesn't work. If before you execute your code, you don't have a good idea of why it should do what you think it will do, then you'll be stuck in a situation where you cannot tell whether there's a mistake or the model is simply no good. That's a very uncomfortable situation to be in, so it's better to think a little bit about how to plan your research and what the models are that you can run where you know what the output should be. Which brings us to the tuning of the hyperparameters. Once you have a reasonable model in place, whether or not you get good performance depends on which values you use for the hyperparameters. And the most important hyperparameter is the learning rate. So let's start there. And most of the things we learn and most of the tricks we will use for tuning the learning rate will translate to other hyperparameters as well. Before we start tuning the learning rate, we have to fix the batch size because changing the batch size changes the, uh, the best learning rate. So it's best to pick a batch size first and then tune a learning rate for that particular batch size. Usually, people go for the biggest batch size that fits into uh, the memory we have available. There is some benefit to going for a slightly smaller batch size, but it also decreases the speed of your model because you lose parallelism because you're not using the uh, full capacity of your memory. So in general, the biggest batch size you can handle is usually the best. And then given that batch size, you simply take a set of learning rates that are logarithmically spaced like this, 0 0.1, 0 0.01, and so on. And you just train them for a few epochs or a few batches even, whatever you can do in, let's say, a few hours, the loss curves per batch. And that looks like this. So for each batch we trained, we plot the loss. And what we see here is that the highest learning rate of 0 0.1 is clearly too high. So the loss never decreases, and it just bounces around, uh, around the, the 1.0 level. For the other learning rates, the loss goes down a bit quicker. We see that uh, with a quite a high learning rate, like 0 0.03, uh, the loss drops very quickly. But with a learning rate like 0 0.01, the loss drops almost equally quickly. And once we get to around batch 250, we see that the green curve, the 0 0.01, tends to drop a little bit lower than the uh, orange curve with the higher learning rate. And what we see is that if we drop even lower, we see that the loss initially doesn't drop as quickly as for the other learning rates, but eventually it joins them and it might even get a little bit lower than the rest. So this is sort of what you're looking for when you plot your loss curves, your per batch loss curves. The range of learning rates between the, uh, the learning rate that is too small to learn anything which is what the 0 0.001 is starting to look like here, and the learning rate that is too high to learn anything. And in between, there's usually a learning rate that gives you a loss curve that decays slowly, but fast enough to be feasible, and that ultimately dips below the rest of the loss curves. One good tool for doing this is TensorBoard, which is integrated with both TensorFlow and PyTorch. So it's worth looking into. It's quite easy to, uh, to use. Another helpful thing is to plot the norm of our gradients. This is basically the size of the step that the uh, optimization process takes at each iteration. What we see is that if the learning rate is too high, then we get a very high variance in the norms. And as the learning rate decreases, the variance in the norms of our gradients uh, gets smaller and smaller. To see what this means and how we can interpret this, let's plot an optimization process in two dimensions. Here we have a loss landscape 
with the bright spots are the minima, the points we want to find. And what we see is that if we put the learning rate too high at 0 0.1, the learning process keeps jumping over all the minima or bouncing around the landscape, but it never successfully converges. And if we are in this situation, we will see a high variance in our uh, gradient updates all throughout the learning process. If the variance changes, it started, starts out relatively slow and then gets higher and higher. It may be that we are stuck in a ball, but we have too high a learning rate to get to the minimum of that ball. We just keep bouncing from wall to wall without ever sinking down into the middle of the ball. And we can see this in our gradient norm curve if the variance of the gradient increases. In the third case, if we've set our learning rate too low, what we'll see is that the variance is very small because the learning process takes tiny little steps and it takes ages to converge to uh, even a, a local minimum. One thing we can do to fix this is to tune the learning rate, but we might, if we're unlucky, be faced with a um, situation where the gradient norms are uneven throughout our training process. We can fix this by adding a learning rate schedule. Here are some basic learning rate schedules. So for each epoch in our training process, we simply assign a multiplier. We have to decide beforehand how long our training process is going to be. And then we simply, for instance, in the simplest case, warm up from zero to one in the first 100 epochs and then keep to a fixed learning rate. We can also do a warm up and then a cool down. So we warm up to the high point of 1.0 as a multiplier for the learning rate and then slowly decay again. And beyond them, that there are lots of nonlinear options as well. If you want to get a little fancier than that, you can try range testing, which is where you do a single training run. You start with a very, very low learning rate and you exponentially ramp it up at every batch. So at every batch, you multiply it, for instance, by 1.1. And you'll get a loss curve like this. The, um, we're looking at the accuracy here, so higher is better. So during the first few steps of training, the accuracy goes up and up and up until the learning rate gets too high and then it starts decaying again. And that point where it starts decaying again, we can use as a good indicator for our maximum learning rate. We can then warm up to that maximum learning rate and then cool down again. So once we have a good learning rate chosen, possibly with a learning rate schedule, if it turned out that we needed that, then it's time to look at per epoch loss curves. These are the loss curves that you don't draw for every batch, but only once per epoch usually. And if they're expensive to compute, maybe once every few epochs. And this is where you can compare the performance on your training set with the performance on your validation set. Because the difference between the those two performances tells you how much your model is essentially overfitting, what we call the generalization gap. So if we have a large difference between our training loss and our validation loss, or between our training accuracy and our validation accuracy, that's a problem that we want to solve. And we'll look uh, in the, the last video in this lecture, we'll look at some ways we can actually, some uh, techniques we can actually use to solve that. So we looked at the learning rate warm up and cooldowns. Another helpful trick is gradient clipping. This is useful if you see a lot of sudden spikes in your gradients that are likely not pointing in a useful direction in the parameter space, but might suddenly push your uh, learning process into a direction you don't want it to go. If you see this, you can simply clip gradients that exceed a particular threshold by clamping them element-wise or by normalizing the total norm. Other things you can do to stabilize and to speed up the learning process are momentum, about which we'll talk later, and regularization and batch normalization, which we'll see in the last video. One thing to remember is that simplicity can be more meaningful than accuracy. What I mean by this is that you, if you get a model that gets great performance, but the only way to get that performance is to set very, very specific hyperparameters and to use very complicated setups, like complex learning, learning rate schedules, then that can actually reduce 
how convincing your result is. Because ultimately what that says is that if the hyperparameters are slightly different and if we don't use precisely this learning rate schedule, then our performance is going to drop. And since reality is always slightly different from a training setting, that probably also means that if there is a slight shift in the uh, data distribution, performance is also going to drop. In other words, if your hyperparameters are very specific, then that might be an indication that your model isn't very robust. So with that, let's look at the rest of the hyperparameters beyond the learning rate. How do we tune those? The first thing to say is that usually, if you're tuning your own model, trial and error is usually good enough. So you can simply pick hyperparameters that you feel like trying, that you think might work, try them, and if they don't work, try some other ones. This sounds very ad hoc, but it's actually a very good idea because this allows you to use any insights you might have about how your model works. And automated methods for hyperparameter tunings don't perhaps share that kind of model insight. In short, you know what your hyperparameters mean, so you can tune them most effectively. It is, however, difficult to do it fairly because nobody tunes their baselines as much as their own model. So when it comes to tuning your baselines, you need to be a little bit more precise. And one way to do that is to make the tuning automatic. And one way to do automatic tuning is to do a grid search. So in a grid search, we simply pick a set of candidate values for uh, every single hyperparameter that we have. And we simply try the uh, Cartesian product of all these hyperparameters and we pick the best one. This isn't actually the best way to use the uh, computation available to you. Uh, as this picture shows, if we use a grid layout and we have one parameter that's not very important and one parameter that is very important for performance, in this case, we're only testing three values in each direction. Whereas if we slightly randomize the layout so that along the directions, the um, parameter values don't overlap as it were, then in the direction of the important parameter, it turns out we're trying lots of different values. So for this reason, what is known as a random layout or a random search can actually uh, give you much better performance. So if you, even if you're doing automatic tuning, a grid search is not always the best uh, thing to try. And this kind of automatic tuning is becoming more and more important as the field of deep learning matures, because what we're seeing is that some of the is that some of the exciting advances from the early days of deep learning are disappearing or turning out to be not as strong as they seemed. And this is a drawback of tuning your model by trial and error. There's a lot of room for cherry picking, for publication bias, and lots of other effects that mean that the performances that we are seeing published are not quite reproducible. And the picture that's emerging is that what is required in deep learning is that occasionally we take all the models that, uh, that represent the current state of the art and we pit them against each other in a fair run where each of them is given the same amount of compute to optimize its hyperparameters. So for this, we really need automatic hyperparameter tuning. Here are three papers that are, um, that are about this sort of thing in different, uh, in different fields. And the way this is usually done is to start with a random search using Sobel configurations for discrete parameters. And a Sobel configuration is simply a random layout of the hyperparameters that is a little bit more evenly spread out than a purely random layout would be. And then using Bayesian search for the continuous hyperparameters, which is a particular optimization strategy using principles from uh, probability theory. This is not usually something you want to implement yourself. So uh, platforms like ax.dev uh, can help you do this easily, but it does take a lot of compute to, uh, to do this well. So finally, that brings us to the final step in the pipeline. We've created a good model, we're happy with it, and we want to either publish it or push it to production. There's not much I want to say about this, um, but one thing that's good to do in uh, publishing is an ablation study. Basically, once you've chosen your model, probably you've introduced a large number of features to get it to the performance where you wanted it, uh, where you wanted to get it to. 
And a very reasonable question to ask at that point is which of these features helped us to achieve, helped us the most to achieve this kind of performance. And this is what ablation studies are for. So the basic process is we build the best model we can build, we test its performance, it's good, then we remove the features one by one, and at each step we measure the impact to see how much the performance degrades. And here's just one example, which is an ablation study in the uh, paper that introduced the BERT model. The flip side of academia is um, commerce. So if you're working for a company and building a product, then once you finish your model, you want to push it to production. Um, that's a little bit out of the scope of these lectures, but I just wanted to say that that step is not to be underestimated. Uh, there are a lot of problems that make machine learning models misbehave in the wild in ways that they didn't during training. For instance, there are things like distributional drift. So your customers might behave differently now than they did when you captured your training data. You might be faced with things like cost of inference. So it might take a millionth of a dollar to run one forward pass on your network. But that means that every product recommendation if that's what your network is doing, every product recommendation needs to bring in that, mon that amount of money at least, or you're running a loss, no matter how good your model is. And finally, there's a very important difference between making predictions and taking actions. So a recommender system might be very good at predicting which movie a user might like to see, but because you're sending your, move your users in a particular direction, you're also, by taking an action, altering the distribution of your data. You're changing the way users navigate your site in a way that you weren't trained for. You were only trained to predict. So there's a feedback loop that can emerge uh, once you start taking actions based on your predictions. And uh, that feedback loop was never taken into account during the training of the model. So that brings us to the end of the general timeline. In the next video, we'll dig a little deeper into the question, why does deep learning actually work? How is it that with such a simple algorithm as gradient descent combined with backpropagation, we can train networks of millions and even billions of parameters?